They said it wouldn't last. White man, black man, America F1. America F1 coming to you straight from San Francisco, California. Sherman Tillman, Michael Lawler. America F1. We would be honored if you would join us. We would be honored if you would. Yeah. What's happening, everybody out there? Today's show on America F1 podcast will be on one Nico Eric. Rossberg. Hell, I don't. Like hell, I. We're doing a special. We're doing the champions of F1 while we're all sitting on our couches, jonesing for F1 to start and to see all the new libraries and to see all the new colors and to see all the new cars and to see who's going to be the quickest and who's caught up to Red Bull while we're doing all that we're doing shows on the champions of F1 my co-host Mike has taken his first vacation in years he's out in Thailand right now enjoying the weather while it's raining back here the sights and the sounds my other special guest co-host PJ is a no-show. So that means the show must go on. And this is the first time and the first show that I'm doing all by myself. Yeah. Last week we did our show on Mika Hakkinen, the flying fin. Now, one Nico Eric Rosberg was born June 27th, 1985, in West Bayern, West Germany. Now, when I butcher names today, if I do, I don't have Mike here to correct me on the right pronunciation, even though a lot of times he's wrong. So bear with me, people, if I mess up somebody's name. I don't want to hear you crying like a baby. That's right. Huh? Yeah, I, I I mess up from time to time. I'll admit it. Huh? Yeah. Don't harm me. Anyway, his active years were 2006 to 2016. Teams that he raced for were only two, Williams and Mercedes. Nico had 23 wins, 57 podiums, 30 poles, 20 fastest laps, His first race win came in, or his first race actually, was the 2006 Bahrain Grand Prix. His first win came six years later at the 2012 Chinese Grand Prix. You can see more about Nico Rosberg at NicoRosberg.com. He's a commentator frequently on F1 TV, and I actually think... Nico Rosberg, out of all the champions that only won one championship, like his dad, Kiki Rosberg, he's one of the better ones. I think if Lewis Hamilton wasn't at Mercedes and he would have had somebody else, I think he would won all the championships. That's how good I think Nico Rosberg was. People don't really realize how fast he was over a lap because you have to compare him to, you know, one of the best of all time, Lewis Hamilton, because they're kind of intertwined because they grew up together. They were in karting together. They, you know, they live in the same building in Monaco. They've been together for so long. So it's almost impossible to think about Nico Rosberg and not think about Lewis Hamilton. But I think that's unfair to Nico. I think Nico, on his own, was one hell of an F1 driver. He was fast. He was quick. He could think on his feet. He had good race craft. You know, at some point he crashed into Hamilton those times. But he had good race craft. I just think he was a hell of a driver. And I don't think people really put the respect on his name that they should. 
He was also the GP2 champion in 2005. And of course, he was the 2016 world champion. Now, one thing about Nico is that he actually had gotten into the Imperial College in London to study aerodynamics. He speaks five languages. And when he did a test at Williams with uh, Sam Mitchell, I think was his director back then. They focused his test on driving with understeer and oversteer and adjusting the differential and solving issues with the car. And Nico scored really, really high. So high, in fact, and so impressed was one Sam Mitchell that he recommended that Nico get the seat after being GP2 champion. Because, you know, they brought in other people to test. And Nico was by far up and away ready to go and ready to race. Now, like we do when we talk about champions from yesteryear, we always like to set the stage to let you know who they were going up against and who the other drivers were on that grid. So here's some of the drivers. Well, actually, here are all the drivers from the 2016 F1 race season. You had number one that year with 385 points was Nico Rosberg, 2016 world champion. The number two slot was held by one Lewis or Sir Lewis Hamilton. He had 380 points. Yes, that's right. Nico beat him by five points. It came down to the last race in Adenabi, as you all may recall. We'll talk about more about that later. Number three that year, if you didn't know it, was one crazy cat, Daniel Ricciardo, with 256 points. Yes, he beat your boy, Max Verstappen, back then. Or was Max even... In the grid, oh, I don't think he was in the grid. I probably uh, overstepped on that. Okay, actually, he was in the grid, and Daniel Ricciardo beat him. And you, all you Max fans are always saying, "Oh, Max has never been beaten." Blah blah blah. Well, Daniel Ricciardo had two hundred fifty-six points that year. Max Verstappen had two hundred and four points that year in fifth place, and in fourth place was Sebastian Vettel with two hundred and twelve points. In sixth place was Kimi Raikkonen with 185, 186 points. The Iceman. Checo Sergio Perez at 101 points in seventh place. Valtteri Bottas came in eighth with 85 points. Nico Hulkenberg was in ninth with 72 points. Remember, this is going back to when Fernando Alonso was driving, I think he was driving the McLaren, which was uh, not that, you know. He had 54 points. Felipe Massa had 53 points. Carlos Sainz Jr. was 12th with 46. Roman Grosjean, the Phoenix, the guy who came out of fire, was in 13th with 29 points. Daniel Kafiat, I think they called him the, or Sebastian Vettel called him the missile. He was in 14th place and he had 25 points. A one Jensen Button. The smoothest, one of the smoothest drivers of all time, Jensen Button, was in 15th place. He had 21 points. Kevin Magnuson was in 16th place. He uh, had seven points that year. Philippe Nasir was in 17th. Julian Palmer, who is now a great commentator on F1 TV. I love Julian Palmer's uh, breakdowns of races and such. He was on 18th place. Pascal Verline, who I think he does Formula E, which oh, I can't stand that sound. People, if you go to Formula E, just come on, man. Give us some fake sound. Give us some better tracks. I'm not a fan of Formula One. Formula E, I think it's a, a dying. Everyone's, oh, it's the future. It's the future. No, electric cars won't be the future. You know why? Because the grid can't take it and they're not fixing the grid. They're not building up the grid first and then selling you electric cars. They're selling you electric cars first and then trying to build the grid. There's no way in America you're going to have 100 million, 200 million Teslas or electric cars running around. The grid can't handle it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. They're going to go to something like hydrogen or something else. 
Electric cars are bad for the planet, man. All you planet huggers out there talking about this and that. The electric car, the batteries are horrible. They're horrible. Where are you going to put those things on the earth? I'm just letting you know. All right, I digress. I know. I know Mike's not here. He, he's the one that always digress. Not me. I don't digress like he does. But I don't, I don't need no Michael Jackson telling me I'm digesting. Yeah, 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 okay. In 18th place, Stoffel Van Doom, or Vandadrome. I didn't say Vandadrome, but I guess it's Van Doom. He's another Formula E guy. Um, and Esteban Guterres, who Mike says is one of the worst Formula One drivers he's ever seen. Um, um, he's up there. He's probably top five. Pretty bad. Um, Marcus Erickson was in 21st, tied with no points, of course, and Esteban Ocon and Rio Hariato. Now, that was the grid back then. Pretty, pretty substantial grid. A lot of the guys that are still, they're still driving today. Now, when we talk about Nico Eric Rosberg, we want to add some of the quotes that he said. And like we did last week, what we did with uh, the Flying Finn, give you quotes from teammates, give you quotes from what other people thought about Nico, and then also give you some quotes of what Nico had to say. Now, when you think about these quotes that are coming from the drivers, none of them are very um, life-changing. They all pretty much sound the same, like they came from, you know, some type of cookie cutter uh, soundbite school. But it is what it is. And we're going to give you all the quotes right here about Nico. Well, these are all quotes that Nico Rosberg said that are attributed to him as his greatest quotes. A lot of combing I had to do for that stuff. I'll tell you. Okay. Nico Rosberg on winning. It's a childhood dream come true. Winning the Formula One World Championship is a feeling that's indescribable. On competing with Lewis Hamilton. Lewis is one of the best drivers in the history of Formula One. You can only be the best if you beat the best. On retirement, I have climbed the mountain. I am at the peak, so this feels right. We'll talk more about his retirement on resilience. Every time I've had a tough time in my career, I've come back stronger, and that's a great feeling. On perseverance, I've always believed that if you work hard and you never give up, you will fight back. Okay. And that's that's really yeah. On pressure, pressure is a privilege. It's what I've worked hard for. I don't find the pressure to perform in any way a burden. Now, I like that quote because when you think about it, pressure is a privilege. Why do you, why does he say that? Break that down a little bit. Because you're in the position where you can perform and you can crack under pressure or you can embrace the pressure. But you're in that position where where pressure matters. A lot of people are in through life or in jobs that aren't super pressure cookers. They don't really have any hard, you know, their hardest decision is where to put the play, paper clips or maybe what they're having for dinner that night or maybe with, where they're going on vacation. But when you're in the sports realm and especially the motorsports realm, you're, there's always some new kid trying to take your seat unless you're number one. There's always somebody else breathing down your neck. So he's saying that to be the in the position that he's in is a privilege. So the pressure comes with the territory and it's no big deal. I like that quote. I really do. I've heard it from other like LeBron James and Messi. I've heard it from other really big sports um, people. And it's one that I think is uh, well worth Telling to your kids, well worth kind of having as a moniker um, in the household that pressure is a privilege. And it's very easy to remember. Pressure is a privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On success. Victory is a fantastic feeling. There's no substitute for that. 
Okay, that's cookie cutter. Anybody says that. On personal growth. In F1, the most important thing is to be perfect in every arena. And that's what I've really tried to work on all my life. To really try and improve and try and get close to being perfect. Okay, I mean, I guess that's a quote, but uh, perfection. Perfection 2D is quite essential. You have to live up to your potential. On teamwork. I have the highest respect for the guys in the garage and on the pit wall. It's a team sport, and I'm just the one lucky guy who gets to drive the car. Okay, all right. Okay, Eric. On life after Formula One, I'm exploring different avenues, and I'm excited about what life holds outside of Formula One. Well, he's excited about what life holds outside of Formula One, but he sure is on damn Formula One commentating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or blogging about it a lot. <laughs> but you know what? I actually, out of all the commentators and all the pundits, other than myself and Mike, of course, I like Jensen Button. I like Nico Rosberg. I like Julian Palmer. I like, and if I had to pick out of those three, I wouldn't. I, I think all three of them do a very good job. Um, in their own distinct way. Uh, I think that, of course, here at America F1, me and Mike do a supreme job because we bring a little levity to the situation. And also, we don't take ourselves seriously and we have no corporate overlords telling us what we can and cannot say because we can say whatever the hell we want to. Anyhow, moving on. What are some of the other drivers in that era saying about one Nico Eric Rosberg? Lewis Hamilton. Nico was a fierce competitor on the track and have the utmost respect for his talent and determination. Sebastian Vettel. Nico was always a tough rival and his technical prowess made him a force to be reckoned with in Formula One. One Fernando Alonso. Nico's dedication and consistency set a high standard for us all, and he was a true professional throughout his career. Jensen Button. Racing against Nico was always a challenge, and he pushed me to elevate my own performance on the circuit. Daniel Ricciardo. Nico's approach to racing was methodical and precise, and he was a formidable adversary in every race we competed in. The Iceman, Kimi Raikkonen. Nico was a skilled driver with a deep understanding of the sport, and his commitment to excellence was evident in his racing. Felipe Massa. Nico's commitment to Formula One was unwavering, and he earned his place among the top drivers in the sport through hard work and talent. Max, 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 Max for stepping, da na na na. Max for stepping, yeah! Don't, like hell I don't. Nico's achievements in Formula One speaks for themselves, and he was a respected figure both on and off the track. Sergio Perez. Nico's competitive spirit and determination made him a formidable opponent, and his legacy in Formula One is well deserved. So those are what some of his peers think of Nico Rosberg. When I think back on Nico's career, especially at Williams, let's talk about who were Nico Rosberg's teammates and how did he do against every teammate? Let's talk about that. Are you ready? Wall, and nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. And I'll build them very inexpensive. The wall. Goes, ah, ah, ah. Ba, 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 ba. Mm. Bing, bing, bong, bong, bing, teammates oh. of Nico Rosberg. Berg. All right, as you know, his first teammate was Mark Weber, 2006. Mark Weber, obviously being a seasoned veteran at that time, beat Nico Rosberg 11 to 6 in races that year in 2006. But he moved on to uh, Red Bull, I think. Now, let's see, did he move to Red Bull Weber in 2016? No, he had already been at Red Bull, so this was kind of his last. He was at Williams, so that was his last uh, hurrah. 
Rosberg versus Wernz. He was uh, Wernz. He was in 2007. Uh, Nika waxed him 12 to three, and he was replaced by Nakajima, who Nico uh, beat 1-0 in 2007, and Nakajima came back in 2008 and. 2009 and Rosberg beat him 12 5 and 15 to 2 in 2009. Then came the great one, one Red Baron, one Michael Schumacher to help this new Mercedes team have a little cachet with a seven time world champion. And it was after his retirement, he was coming back and some people say he didn't have that much left. I think the first two years, I think he, he was with he was with Nico from 2010, 2011, and 2012. But in the 2012 season, his last season, when he was 42 years old, he really, I thought, Schumacher had a good season. Even though Nico uh, uh, beat him in every season, uh, actually in 2012... They were even in, in you know, uh, races, nine to nine. But in 2010, Shumi's first year, Nico beat him 15 to four. In 2011, it was 11 to seven. In 2012, Schumacher's last year, before one Lewis Hamilton signed, it was nine nine. So in Schumacher's last year, and throughout, I think throughout his tenure, he had more DNFs. He had more things wrong with the car. Remember, they're developing the car um, at Mercedes. And, but having said that, Nico Rosberg up against a seven-time world champion got the better of him. I don't care if it was in the beginning of his career. I don't care if it was in the middle of his career. I don't care if it was at the end of his career. It's the fact that he still did it. It's the fact that people don't give Nico the credit that I think he deserves as being not only quick, not only fast, but having that inner strength that it takes to go up against a seven-time world champion. Think about that. He goes to a new team, and in his first year at a new team, he has to go up against Michael Schumacher. I don't care if Michael had retired. Michael knows more or knew more about racing than Nico ever would. That's a pretty formidable opponent. Especially when, from what I hear and what Mike always tells these stories, Schumacher would not even acknowledge Nico's presence. I mean, he, he, he would hold him up in the bathroom. He would do all kinds of mind games against Nico. And Nico just rose above and just... You know, did his talking on the track. Respect, my man. Then in 2013, one Lewis Hamilton came to the team. And in 2013, Hamilton had 11. Nico was 7. 2014, he was 11 to 6. Hamilton, 2015, he was 13 to 6. Hamilton. And even in the year that um, Nico Rosberg won the championship, it was 11-9 for Hamilton, and we can dive deeper into that, but his overall record against opponents was 109-87, and so most of those came, obviously, by uh, Lewis Hamilton. Here's the points breakdown for Rosberg versus Schumacher. Points-wise, in three years... Nico Rosberg scored 324 points. Michael Schumacher scored 197 points. Standing-wise, uh, Nico finished ahead of Schumacher all three years. And in races where both cars finished, Rosberg held the edge 22-15. to 15. DNFs, uh, Schumacher had 15 DNFs. Nico had seven. Uh, race wins over that period. The Mercedes had only won one race, and that was by Nico Rosberg. In quality, Nico was ahead 41. Schumacher had 17. Poles, Nico had one pole. And Schumacher had zero. Now, for the 2013 to 2016 years, which they call, you know, the Silver, the Silver War, which is a great documentary on, I think you can find it. It's by Flows. And you can find it on YouTube if you've never seen it. 
Also, we did a show on that year. Uh, if you go back through our shows and check out, um, we did a show on the greatest rivalries, the 2016 Nico Rosberg, Lewis Hamilton year. Great show, actually. I'd listened to it uh, when I was doing my uh, rehab for my knee uh, the other day, and I listened to the show. And it, yeah, great show. Go, go, go back and listen to that show. It's about 36, 37 minutes long. Great listen while you're in traffic. Uh, it really takes you in depth into the rivalry. All right, so Rossberg and Hamilton, 2013-2016 wins. Rossberg, 22. Lewis Hamilton, 32. Podiums, Rossberg, 50. Lewis Hamilton, 55. Quali, 36 for Nico, 42 for Lewis. And championships, one for Nico and two for Lewis Hamilton. Now, since that is the greatest rivalry, and... I think we did that show uh, it's January 18th the 2023 show now when we go back Kiki Rosberg who also won the world championship and is Nico's dad did not want Lewis to join the Mercedes team because Lewis had beaten Nico in Formula 3 and in karting and actually before Nico won the 2006 World Championship. He had never beaten Lewis Hamilton in a season in anything, uh, in anything race-related. And they were good friends. I remember, and, you know, we'll put this up on our YouTube when we do the YouTube portion of this with videos and such. I mean, these guys were best of friends. They were competitive with each other, and they would challenge each other on anything, whether it was who could eat the fastest hamburger to who could run down the stairs fastest to just totally competitive spirits. But they've known each other since kids. And it's sad to me. And something really bad must have happened between them during that season. And it probably started in 2014, 15. um, That really broke that friendship and since they live in the same building I would hope and who knows I don't know I can't you know no one knows what really went on until we see the book that Lewis is supposed to write one day what a great book that's gonna be I'm surprised that you know Nico hasn't wrote a book on that And I would surmise that when a person doesn't write on something, they had probably a greater hand in whatever was the break. I don't know. I'm speculating. And I don't want to. I don't even know if I want to delve into that. You know why? Because we're here to celebrate Nico. We're not here to put put him down or even think that there's anything nefarious or anything going on. Let's just stick to the what we know. Let's stick to the facts. Let's not stick to speculation or anything like that. Okay? So, the first tension, I think, between those two was 2013 Malaysian Grand Prix. They had team orders for Nico to hold his position in fourth place, and Hamilton um, was on the podium for third. But I remember Lewis giving an interview saying he thought that they shouldn't have gave team orders that Nico had the pace to have third place. But nobody really talks about that because I think this is the same race that happened, the multi-21 incident with uh, Weber and uh, Seb. And so that pretty much was the headline. Nobody really talked about the team orders. Now, when you go to 2014 at the Bahrain GP, which is a fabulous race, one of the, I think, most exciting back and forth between two very good drivers that you would ever see, where they placed their cars, how they made their passes, how they made their defense. It was between Nico Eric Rosberg, and one Sir Lewis Hamilton. If you've never seen the 2014 Bahrain Grand Prix, it's one to watch. It's one to watch just for the battle. And it's not a battle that just went over like one turn or two turns. This battle went on for laps, people. Laps. Hamilton won. 
Rosberg used the ban engine mode by Mercedes that they were telling their drivers not to use to give him more power. Also, he was given telemetry on Hamilton's qualifying by one somebody in Mercedes gave almost a dossier. Now, remember, they're teammates. Now, before this incident, they didn't share. They don't share telemetry. You got your garage. I got mine. We're a team, but I'm against you. You're against me. We're not sharing telemetry. We're not sharing where you where I'm going fast and you're going slow so you can improve. You're not looking at where my brake bias is and where I'm braking and how fast I'm going into this turn and all these things and studying me, studying that. But that's what they did. Somebody from Mercedes gave the telemetry to Rosberg on where Lewis was fast and where he was slow to help Nico in his qualifying pace. 2014 Spain, Ham used that same band Mercedes mode that Nico used to win the Spanish Grand Prix in 2014. 2014 Monaco, as you all may or may not remember, for all you newbies, you probably don't know about this, but it's the same thing that Checo Perez did, not in 23, but in 22, where Nico ran deep at Mirabello. On purpose, some would say. I don't know. I mean, it's pretty. If he did it on purpose, it's a smart move because you secure pole. You don't have to worry about somebody else beating your time because nobody else can go. The session's over. It's the same thing that Checo Perez did. And this is what Max was so pissed about that year when he said he was not moving for Checo and he's not moving and everybody knows why. And don't ask him again. That's what Max had said uh, when Checo did the same thing. Now. After this, Hamilton was pissed and he announced that Nico and him were no longer friends after that. There's a lot of other things that probably happened, but I remember watching this race. I remember watching this qualifying and the first thing I said was, that's pretty smart move by Nico because now you know you're on pole and there's no other place no other place other than the monaco grand prix where qualifying is so important nine million million times out of ten the person who qualifies first at monaco unless they have something wrong with the car or they do a huge huge mistake at the pit wall or in the pits, they're winning that race. I can remember one year that Lewis Hamilton was ahead, and for whatever reason, they brought him in to change tires when he had the lead of the race. And they, of course, uh, had a problem in the pit stop, and he's in the pit stop going, uh, I've lost this race, haven't I? And yes, yes, Lewis, you've lost, because they called you in when you didn't need, you should have just stayed on the tires, which you proved years later when Max was behind you, when you had ball tires, and he still couldn't pass to you. Because that is a place where track position is everything, qualifying is everything. And so when Nico Rosberg ran deep, which I thought was smart, I thought it was awesome. Because I said, now there's a guy who wants to win so bad, he's going to do whatever he has to, to do it. And when it's all said and done... When you're racing against one of the all-time greats, you got to do what you got to do, baby. You can't be worried. You can't be scared. Because it's kill or be killed. It's eat or be eaten. Either you're going to win or he's going to win. You guys know you got the best car. So he did what he had to do. So... I know people are out there and, you know, the Hamilton fans and then I know the Max fans are mad at Checo for doing that and they're mad at Nico for doing this. But, hey, it is what it is. The man got the win. He did what he had to do. In 2014, the Hungarian Grand Prix, they asked Lewis to move over and because Nico had better pace that, that race. And Hamilton said, well, if he catches up, 
then I'll move over. But if he doesn't catch up, I'm just going to continue on with my race. And some people say he should have followed team orders and moved over for Nico. And all pure racers say, well, yeah, if he doesn't have the pace to catch up, then why should you move over? Because he can't even catch up to you. So they had contact in the 2014 Belgium Grand Prix. Ham had a puncture in his left. uh, I think, yeah, in his left. And Nico had left the nose of his car in and he said he I left it in there to prove a point. So basically saying he wasn't going to move over for Lewis anymore, that he was tired of the team orders or any acquiescing to Lewis. And, you know, I, I get it. it. It's only two cars that are in the championship fight and you're trying to win as many races as you can. You got to do what you got to do. In 2015, Hamilton won three races uh, the championship with three races left, and that was at the Circuit of Americas. That was 2015. I was at that race, and I remember it because in the first turn, after you come up that hill and you take that first left, and usually that's where people make a lot of passes. They usually oh, push people off because they have a huge runoff area over there at the circuit of Americas in that first turn and I remember Hamilton pushing Nico wide to take the lead because Nico had qualified on pole and Hamilton was second and then so he ran Nico wide which is racing man that's it's how it is and then you know because of pit stops and all that other things uh, Rosberg was ahead in the closing stages of a race and he made a mistake on I think it's turn 12 so they go through that yeah it's turn 12 so he made a mistake at turn 12 and he ran kind of deep on the turn and then Hamilton came right through and passed him up and that was it that was a wrap and he won the race and he won the world championship at that race and they had three races left that's 2015 and then Nico won the next three races uh to close the season and I thought a lot of people said well you know once Lewis wins he goes into kind of like a party mode and he kind of loses interest and this is back you know this party Lewis not the more mature Lewis that he is now he's 2050 so he's probably going hanging out with his buddies and partying a lot because you know Lewis like he has a lot of um celebrity friends from around the world I mean so he just kind of probably just oh I already won the championship so let's 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 go out and do our thing and then Nico won three races in a row and I think that gave him the confidence and he put before we get to 2016 where Nico won the championship from everything I've read about this Nico got a sports psychologist he stopped eating sugar he didn't put his when, when his uh, kid was crying or something his wife would take care of it he put everything into the 2016 season and I do mean everything his life every all his habits was geared to winning the championship in 2016 now Mercedes had a little hand in this because they remember if you recall or if you don't recall because you're new to Formula One they switched garages yes that's right all the mechanics and garage mates who worked on Lewis's car they switched them to Nico's car and then all Nico's mechanics and drivers or mechanics and engineers and such they switched to Lewis's car that was strange to me. I've never heard of that before. I've never seen it since. And I've been watching these races for quite uh I mean, off and on since the 70s. But really, seriously, probably in 2007, I probably. From 2007 on, I think I've watched every race. Um, off and on in the 70s I watched, off and on in the 80s I watched, off and on in the 90s I watched, but I got serious about it 
around that time. I've never heard of switching garages between teammates before. I never heard of giving telemetry to the opposition before before that point. I mean, they do it all the time now. I mean, I remember uh, Lewis Hamilton when he was at McLaren complaining that he thought Jensen Button had uh, gotten some of his telemetry and he was upset about that. And that was the first I had ever heard of it back then. And then now here we go again with Mercedes. So the Mercedes, the conspiracy is, well, they're a German team. And, you know, they had to do this to help Nico, blah, blah, blah. And as you remember, it all came down to um, where Hamilton had a DNF. I think it was in Singapore or Malaysia. And he was by the car pretty distraught because if he was ahead and he'd won that race, he probably would have won the championship. But we all know that in a championship fight, car reliability, uh, DNFs, uh, pit wall decisions, they all go into it into a close battle championship uh, without, you know, help from uh, the stewards or anything like that. But in this case, Lewis Hamilton's car was the only Mercedes car to suffer a DNF the whole season or for the engine to blow up like it did. And he, he was really uh, distraught, obviously. And he thought that maybe there was sabotage going on. I don't think that. I just think that it's hot. He's pushing the car. He's way ahead. And, you know, sometimes something happens to the car and it gives way. And it will happen when you're behind and it will happen when you're ahead. And this was just one of those things. Now, conspiracy people say, well, Mercedes pushed a kill switch button because they wanted Nico to win. I say when you say that, you take away all the hard work and effort that one Nico Eric Rosberg put into the 2016 season to win his world championship whether it was by five points or by one point I don't care the man won the last three races of 2015 the man won the first four races in 2016 he was committed he did what he had to do to win And nobody should try to belittle or take away that championship from him because he deserved it. Now, 2016, they had a Spanish Grand Prix, as we all know. That was one spectacular crash where Nico Rosberg was in the wrong mode. And Lewis Hamilton was probably about 11 miles, 11 kph or you know, 15 miles an hour faster because they were, it was coming off of, uh, right at the finish, the the start of the race and launch. And so Lewis went to the inside. Like if you remember that move he made on Charles Leclerc, um, in 2023, when he went on the inside and he kind of kicked up some, some grass. But in this instance, when he did the same move to Nico, Nico kind of cut him off and kind of rode him into like instead of just like maybe two wheels on the grass, like he had full on four wheels on the grass. He kind of lost it and he swung and swerved right into Nico and took both cars out. And we all know that one thing you don't do is crash into your teammate. This was a pretty spectacular crash. You can see it on YouTube. Well, actually, I don't know if in this tribute to Nico, I don't think I will put it up because I think that is one of the things that you should see for yourself. Maybe I'll put up some stills of it or something like that. But in in the big scheme of things, when you're in a tight battle, for a championship and remember it's 2016 Lewis has already won two championships between the teammates since they've been together and Nico is doing everything he has to do 
to win a championship. And if it means not yielding and we crash, well, that's what it means. That's what it means. That's racing. That's hard racing. And I think in the scheme of things, in the frame of mind that Nico had to be in at that moment, he's standing up for himself. He's saying no more. Yeah, I made a mistake on the mode, but I don't care. I got the lead. If we both get out of the race, then he can't score more points than I can. In the 2016 Australian Austrian Grand Prix, uh, Nico goes straight. And I remember this one. This is a funny one. They're having this right turn, and it's a pretty, it's a hairpin right. So you really got to slow down. You got to really get the apex of the car to make this turn. Hamilton w- looks like he was passing Nico uh, from the outside, and instead of Nico turning the wheel to make the turn, he, his car just went straight and straight right into. Um, Lewis Hamilton, and he got two penalty points for that uh, because he didn't he didn't turn the wheel, and you know he made a bunch of excuses about it, but I think he saw that Lewis was passing him, and was like, I'm not giving up any points, I'm gonna crash into him, and take us both out. But in that race, as I recall, it only ended up Nico having a puncture. And then Hamilton finished that race, and I think he 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 won that race. So that didn't go as planned. <laughs> and then you go all the way to the 2016 Abu Dubai or Adenabi race where Nico won his world championship. Now, when you set that race, Lewis Hamilton's winning the race. All Nico has to do is finish behind. You know, second place, and he wins. So, first or second? If Lewis finishes first, he has to finish second. If he finishes ahead of Lewis, it didn't, I don't think it mattered where Lewis would have finished. So, Lewis is way ahead, and this is great racecraft from the both of them, really. So, what he does is he tries to back, just like Carlos Sainz did at Singapore and two. 2023 this year when he won it the only race by anybody other than Red Bull he slowed down to back up Nico Rosberg into the field I think Sebastian Vettel or Daniel Ricciardo was third and he was trying to back them back Nico into them so that they would either crash or pass him thus Lewis Hamilton would win the championship now I remember this now Mercedes had already won the Constructors' Championship. And they were coming on the radio telling Lewis, hey, Lewis, speed up, speed up. You know, you're not going fast enough. And he's like, guys, guys, we've already run the Constructors' Championship. I'm, not, I'm trying to win the Drivers' Championship. Lead me to it. And, you know, it was just such tension because, you know, you could hear Nico complaining, like, why doesn't he speed up? Like, he's backing me into the field. Like, what is he doing? You know, what? this is a team. You know, we're on a team. Aren't we in a team? And you could hear the stress in his voice. That had to be the accumulation of all that stress of fighting Lewis Hamilton and then having to hold on to second place fast enough not to get pushed back into the field. Had to just be nail biting for not only his wife. Total Wolf and everybody else in the garage, but just think of the pressure that he's under, knowing that Lewis is backing him in. He can't go fast enough to pass Lewis because Lewis would only go slow in certain sectors, and that's what you do when you're trying to back up the field. You're still having good pace, but you're slowing down in certain areas that you know you can slow down in, and that you know you have to speed out of it. So that's how you. You know, typically back up um, other cars in certain sectors where you know they can't pass you and you try to slow down in those sectors and hopefully the field catches up. So that's what he was trying to do. And that's what Carlos Sainz did uh, very uh, well in Singapore. And I think it's a great racecraft by both drivers, one, to back up the field and two, 
for Nico not to be backed into the field. So when he won that race, or second place, and he won the world championship, just think about all the weight that was lifted from one Nico Eric Rosberg's shoulders. It's the first time he beat Lewis Hamilton in a car over a season. Then he goes to pick up his trophy at the FIA dinner where they award, you know, first place, second place, third place, rookie of the year, uh, you know, driver year, that type of thing. And after getting his trophy, he announces that he's retiring. I kind of had predicted that he would do something like that. And the reason why I predicted way back then that he would do that, it's the first time the guy beat Lewis Hamilton. What better time to retire with the trophy, knowing that Lewis can't come back at you to reclaim it, and knowing all the effort, time, sacrifice that you put into it, that not just you, but your wife, your whole family put in to sacrificing to get this championship. And now you get to retire on top. I respect the hell out of that. I don't know what you think out there. You might, a lot of people think, oh, he should have came back to defend the championship. Why did he leave? I respect guys that leave on top. Because when you leave on top, that means you had a little left. And it always keeps people wondering, what if, what if, what if. But you're satisfied. He achieved his childhood dream of being a world champion. And he did it. There's a lot of Formula One drivers who never win a race. There's a lot of Formula One drivers who never get on a podium. So to win and to be able to be on the right time, the right team at the right time, the right place, and for all the stars to align so you can win that world championship. Much respect to one Nico Eric Rosberg. And I hope you enjoyed our trip back to memory lane to talk about one of the great champions of Formula One. One of the great ones who've won just one championship. I think Nico Rosberg uh, deserves more accolades than he probably gets. I think more people should really go back and take a look at some of his races and his career and how fast and quick he was and how he placed the car and the passes that he made, his defenses that he made. I think he was a great driver. I mean, you know, I, I don't have him in my top 10 or anything of all time, but I do respect his abilities. I do respect the way he went about his career. <coughs> Excuse me. And I do respect that he retired on top. So saying that, keep on racing, everybody. And stay tuned for our next show when I think we're going to do maybe Fernando Alonso. It looks like people want to see. And he's still racing. So that be good for all the crowd that's just getting into Formula One. And it's somebody that they can identify with. No. So the next show we'll be doing on the great Fernando Alonso. This is. Sherm Tillman for America F1, and I hope you enjoyed our podcast on one Nico Eric Rosberg. Keep on racing, everybody. <laughs>